One of the important things for a believer, and especially in an age like the age we live in, and it is to be able to maintain a nuanced understanding of things. Uh, in other words, to be able to understand that there are two sides to the coin, that there is more than one answer to questions, that there is inevitably, uh, there is inevitably that which goes beyond our ability as finite <coughs> creatures to comprehend. The believer has chosen and by the grace of Allah has been blessed to orient himself or to orient herself in a position that says, Amantu Billah, I believe in Allah. May Allah make us steadfast in that. And may He never take away our faith, no matter what He takes from us. Allahumma la, don't take away our Iman. So the believer has already oriented himself in the correct position by saying, I believe in Allah. And then after that, they inevitably have to explore what that orientation means vis-a-vis -vis their lived reality and vis-a-vis -vis the lived reality of the community and the world that they live in. We're very fortunate as believing people to have been chosen, to have been graced, to have been honored, to be from the community of the beloved Prophet Sayyidina Muhammad Rasulullah And Allah reminds us in the Quran about that blessing so many times and so many verses uh, that would go on beyond the scope of the brief moments we've been afforded this afternoon. One of the beautiful things about the Prophet وسلم, and everything about him is beautiful. Even in his majesty there is beauty وسلم, Peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Even in those moments in which he must necessarily respond to given events in a way that is authoritative, in a way that is proper, even in those majestic manifestations is beauty because in him وسلم, is the fulfillment of all of the manifestations of Allah's beautiful names and Allah's majestic name, the majestic names Azza wa Jalla. The Prophet وسلم, is understood to be not only the person who Allah gave the revelation, but also to be understood to be the greatest manifestation of all of the names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That may sound esoteric, that may sound too deep, that may sound beyond the scope of what some of us are ready to reflect upon, but even you and I have been instructed to try to take on the character traits of Allah when the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ Take on, O Kim Al-Qadr Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, take on the character traits of God to the extent that is humanly possible. In other words, Allah is merciful, so we are to try to be merciful. Allah is just, so we are to try to be just. Allah Azza wa Jalla is forbearant. We are to try to be forbearant, etc., etc. So all of those realities are most prominently and most manifestly uh, seen in the beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he has outward realities and he has inward realities, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One of those things, and this is what we wanted to speak about and reflect upon briefly today, is in that narration where the companion said, by Allah, I never saw the face of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after I became Muslim illa wa kana mubtasima except that he was smiling Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Now there's two really interesting things about that There's a lot that can be said but two points will focus on one uh, I never saw his face after becoming Muslim What does that mean for us? How do we treat those people who are new to the faith? How do we treat those people that are exploring the faith? How do we treat those people that may be visitors? How do we treat those people that may be less than us? If we would be so arrogant as to deem anybody less than us in their level of religiosity, when they see our faces, what do they see? Do they see a frown that wants to remind them that they need to get themselves right? Do they see an angry face that wants to prove to them that, look, brother, this is serious? Do they see a, huh, a disciplinary figure that wants to uh, correct them? Or do they want to see a face that is like the face of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wa kana muqtasima Except that he was smiling Well this begs a really important question What was going on in the Prophet's life that may have led him not to be smiling? All of the things that you and I struggle with on a day to day basis And I'm not talking about myself here per se Nor am I talking about any one of you in particular per se But all of the things that we as people struggle with The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi had some semblance or some resemblance or some uh, part of that we have family troubles, we have difficult people in our families that give us a hard time. The Prophet ﷺ had people around him that gave him a hard time. We have spousal conflict or spousal tension. The Prophet ﷺ, and this is talked about in the Qur'an. The Prophet ﷺ had difficult times with his 
noble wives. Allah be well pleased with them. Uh, what did he do? When the prophet's sitting eating and uh, one of his noble wives made a dish and another one of them, Allah be anhu jami'an, became jealous. So she comes in, the lady Aisha, Allah be pleased with her. And he's sitting with a group of his companions in his home. And the lady Aisha comes in and she flips up the plate. Well, what would happen if that happened in your house? What would happen if that happened in my house? Guys, you better leave. <laughs> I'll see you guys at the masjid for Fajr. Uh, see you guys at the office on Monday. What do you say? Mudu adiyakum. Qadat ummukum. Eat, your mother got jealous. SubhanAllah. One of the most amazing things about the Prophet is his ability to diffuse socially awkward and socially tense situations, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they used to test him. The Bedouin came to the Prophet, he said, Oh Muhammad, give me from the wealth of Allah, not from the wealth of your mother or father. Now what happens? Umar takes out his sword, he says, Ya Rasulullah, da'ni aqtar sahad al Oh Messenger of Allah, give me permission to cut off the head of this hypocrite. The Prophet said, no, I don't want it to be said that Muhammad kills his companion, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He didn't say he's not a munafiq. He didn't say, don't, he said what? Don't do that because I'm concerned about the image of Islam publicly. I'm worried about how this will reflect on the community. I'm worried about how people will see us if we do that kind of thing. And then the Prophet took the man aside and he gave him an abundant gift, a very generous gift. And he said, are you happy? Was that enough? He said, not really, no. <laughs> Imagine going to the head of a community, going to the head of state. No, you're going to the head of creation. Sayyidul Wujud, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The last prophet, and he says, what? Have ikhalik safayt? Was that enough? He said, not really. So he gave him more. He already gave him, he gave him more. He said, was that enough? He said, na'am. Fajazatullahu man ahlin wa ashidatin khayra. He says, yes, thank you very much. May Allah reward you uh, kindly in your clan and in your people. In other words, thank you, my, my Arab brother. And then the Prophet came out and he said, would you mind going to my companions and clarifying to them that you have been sufficed because they're still upset. There's something bothering them. And he's worried about how that will sit in the heart of the companions, but he's also worried about the safety of this individual. So he comes out and he said, tell him that you're happy. So the man said, Alhamdulillah, the Prophet gave me enough. I'm obviously paraphrasing, paraphrasing for time's sake. The Prophet gave me enough and he went on. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the Prophet's laying under the tree, <coughs> By himself, no security guards, no gatekeeper, no stormtroopers, huh? there's no guards, all by himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the man comes to him and raises a sword above him, he said, who will defend you against me now? And he says, Allah, and the sword falls. So the Prophet says, and picks up the sword, who said, who's going to defend you now? He said, just be gentle in punishing me because you're a good brother. Huh? <laughs> the Prophet said, go, you're free. And the man goes to his people, he said, oh, my people become Muslim because I came from the best of people. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in the other narration, he said, because he said, ya qawmi aslimu, about the man who got the gift. He said, ya qawmi aslimu, oh, my people become Muslim. لِأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا يُعْطِي عَطَاءَ مَنْ لَا يَخْشَ Because Muhammad gives the giving of a person who fears not poverty. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Those are the people who were ill to him. Those are the people who disrespected him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His own personal challenges vis-a-vis -vis the fact that his people are denying him. He's been exiled from his beloved homeland. And the Prophet loved Mecca. He wasn't like, you know, uh, just a matter of religious processing. He personally loved Mecca. When he left, he said, Oh Allah, you're taking me out of the most beloved city to me. So let me live in the most beloved city to you. And in one narration, he speaks to Mecca in the second person. And he says, Indeed, you, O Mecca, are the most beloved of God's land to me. And had it not been that your people exiled me, I would never have left you. So leaving Mecca was painful for the Prophet ﷺ. Many of us may have experienced a piece of that for one reason or another, had to move unexpectedly, whether it was under political distress or any other situation, economic distress or whatever. Or a person left their homeland and they missed home. The Prophet had that ﷺ. People tried to kill him. And in Uhud, when they come and they're fighting the Prophet ﷺ, and the companion said to them, Ya Rasulullah, O oh, Messenger of Allah, curse them. And what did he say? I was not sent to curse people. Innama, and rather, I was sent as a mercy. And he said, O oh, Allah, guide my people, for they do not know what they're doing. And in the narration, O oh, Allah, forgive my people, for they do not know what they're doing. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So fill in the blank. 
Whatever difficulty we're experiencing, the Prophet was experiencing that, not to mention perhaps the most important point that revelation is descending on his blessed heart. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How weighty was that? It was so weighty that when the revelation would descend and he's riding in Qaswa, you could see tears come from Qaswa's face, the camel. Sometimes she would fall to the ground. When his blessed head was laying on the thigh of Sayyidina Abu Bakr as Siddiq and the revelation descends, Sayyidina Abu Bakr said, I thought my thigh was going to burst out of the weight of the revelation. So he's experiencing all of that and he's still what? Smiling. Allahumma salli wa sallim alayhi wa alayhi May Allah give us to smile more. You wonder sometimes, you come to Muslim spaces and you wonder, either we have a muscular dysfunction in our faces. Huh? Brother, what's wrong here in the masjid, huh? You see the brother, no, Akhi, I'm religious. <laughs> so where are you from? <laughs> Didn't he say, in Ibtisama to Fiwaji Akhika Sadaqa? Smiling in the face of your brother is a charity. Well, you don't know what I'm going through. You're right, and you don't know what I'm going through. So let's set that all aside and just love one another. May Allah give us to love one another. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, this is not a masjid that necessarily needs this class, needs this particular lesson. Uh, because alhamdulillah, there's a lot of love in this masjid, but we don't want to be that one person. We don't want to be that one person who couldn't find it in ourselves to channel that prophetic mercy and to just smile. May Allah give us to smile. Amen. And as some of you know better than me, it takes more muscles to frown than it does to smile. It's easier to smile than it is. And you know, you again, no matter how hard it may be, I'll never forget one time being abroad overseas, and I came to visit one of my teachers before coming home. And I had waited several days, literally several days, to see the Sheikh. And I'm waiting to get directives about what I should do when I get home to America and how I should engage a community. And I'm having a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the Sheikh, and it took all of this time. And finally, I come in, and I'm waiting. And it says, it says, uh, he says, my son, my advice to you, when you go home to America, just smile. And I'm thinking, okay, what else? He said, just smile. And remind the brothers about the importance of smiling. And then he said something very interesting. And this isn't someone who's read up on, uh, you know, deep socio sociological studies, read up on demographic research. This is someone of intuition. He said, because my experience has been with American people that they know a sincere smile from an insincere smile. They know when someone's trying to sell them something. So he said, benefit from the beauty of a sincere smile. May Allah give our faces to smile, Ya Rabbi Nani. Now here's the really important part. He's also described, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as always being in a somber, sober, or perhaps even grief-stricken state. How do we reconcile these two? And for those of us who are coming late, we began by saying we have to maintain a nuanced attitude. And this is why hadith are not to be studied without the guidance of a proper teacher. Because you could read one of the hadith and misunderstand it, and you don't know the complimentary hadith. The scholars of commentary said what? His smiling was with the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he was with the community, he was smiling. His grief, his sobriety, his, uh, in his what? Uh, being focused on himself and being saddened, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was when he was alone with his Lord. When he was alone with his Lord, that's when he observed what? A deep, because why? This is someone who understands the reality of the unseen. This is someone who's been shown the realities of eternity and what it means for a human being. This is someone, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who's seen the fire, who's seen paradise, who knows that reality. So naturally, someone who knows that is not going to be sitting alone, huh? Unproperly un cheerful, just sitting and being happy and uh, having a good time because he's thinking about the reality, not only of himself, because he's not worried about himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's worried about you and worried about me and worried about people that you and I may write off. Didn't the companion say we used to withhold from praying that Allah would forgive the people of wrong action in our community? We used to withhold from saying astaghfirullah for the people of major wrong until we heard the Prophet say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shafa'ati li ahlul kaba'ir min ummati O kima qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam My intercession will be for the people of major wrong for my community. So he's not just worried about the good people, the people who are practicing, the people who are praying. He's worried about the people from his community who have inconsistency, who have error, who have sin. He's concerned about them. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you find narrated in the hadith that when he would be in prostration, you could hear him weeping so profusely that it sounded like a pot boiling, like a boiling pot of water. And he used to say, Oh Allah, did you not promise me that you would not punish them? And I am amongst them. 
Oh Allah, did you not promise me that you would not punish them? And they're seeking forgiveness. And this is why one of our early Muslims, our predecessors said, we had two guarantees against the punishment of Allah. One of them was the physical presence of the Prophet ﷺ amongst us. And the other is saying Astaghfirullah. The other is Istighfar. And we have lost that one outwardly, the first one. Not to say that the Prophet's not amongst us in a figurative or in a broader meaning, but physically the Prophet passed. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he said what? So you better do a lot of istighfar. You better say Astaghfirullah a lot. Seek Allah's forgiveness abundantly. And he's the one himself who said, Seek Allah's forgiveness for I seek his forgiveness 70 times a day and in one narration a hundred times a day. May Allah make his people the mistake. So they said he was always smiling when he's with the people. And when he was alone, he was grief stricken. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is what I mean about maintaining a nuanced attitude. And it's not to say that we should be genuinely consistent socially. We should not have a type of schizophrenic uh, contradictory two different modalities. But no, rather when we're alone, we should be people of the deep reverential attitudes. And we should not be people who waste our time. May Allah make that easy for us. Amen. So, can we do that? Can we be people that when we're in a public space, set your, your worries aside for a moment. Set your concerns aside for a moment. Set your uh, criticism of one another or of the community or of the situation aside for a moment. It is smile. And I'll never forget a brother. He came to a masjid once. He told me the story. And on the way out, he kissed a brother on the cheek. And the brother said to him, don't kiss me. I Kiss me. He said, why not? He said, it's not from the Sunnah. He said, it's not Sunnah. He said, but I love you. What's he going to say? What's he going to say? May Allah help us love one another. What's love got to do with it? Inna ladina amanu wa aminu salihati sayyajanu lahum ar rahmanu wudda. Indeed, those who believe and do good deeds, the most merciful will give them love. They'll give, the law will give them love. And the ulama said, Rahimahumullah, there's three ways that this love manifests. One is between the servant and Allah. That Allah will give that individual love, i.e. He will take that individual as one of his beloved. Allah lists amongst his beloved, Ya Allah. Allah lists us amongst his beloved, Ya Allah. When the Prophet said, when Allah loves a servant, he calls Gabriel and he says, Ya Jibreel, inni ahbabtu fulan, and oh Gabriel, I love so and so, so love him. So Gabriel loves that person. And then Gabriel calls out in the heavens, O people of the heavens, indeed Allah loves so and so. So love that person. And he's made, he or she's made beloved in the heavens. And then they're made accepted in the earth. And if Allah hates a servant, he calls Gabriel and says, O Gabriel, I hate so and so, so hate him. And then Gabriel hates that person. He's made it hated in the heavens and made it hated in the earth. Allah save us from ever being from that second category. This is the first way that it manifests. The second way that it manifests, the ulama said, the scholar said, between the believers, that they'll have love with one another. That there'll be people who have a fraternity that is not only outward, but it's actually at a heart level, that they love one another. And he reminds his Prophet وسلم, that the believers are a resource for you. He says, He's the one who empowered you with his victory and with the believers and brought their hearts together. If you spent all of the wealth and the earth on Muhammad وسلم, you would not have brought their hearts together. But Allah brought their hearts together. And he is indeed mighty and wise. So in other words, our hearts being brought together is the way that we are resource for the Prophet But if we don't have hearts that love one another, then that resource unfortunately will be diminished in its value. And then the third way, as we close, they said that if you're someone who believes and if you're someone who does good deeds, Allah will put love between you and even people of the creation that do not believe because in you, in your belief and in your good deeds is proof that you don't have an agenda. Allah will make people love you just because you believe and just because you do good deeds. And this is where the Muslims always succeeded. This is how the Muslims spread Islam. This is how Muslims did da'wah. They didn't need pamphlets historically. I'm not saying pamphlets are a bad thing, but they were enough of a pamphlet. They were enough of a book if you just interacted with them. May Allah revive that in this Ya Rabbil Alameen. And may Allah grant us love between us and creation, between us and one another, and between us and Him Ya Rabbil Alameen. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah al-azim li wa lakum wa lisaid al-Muslimin fa astaghfiru innu hu ghafur wa rahim. Yeah. What's the difference?
الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على مولانا رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه ومن والاه ان ربكم قد امركم بامر بدا فيه بنفسه وثنى فيه بملائكته وقال عز وجل ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد صلاه ترضيك وترضيه وترضى بها عنا يا رب العالمين يا ايها المؤمنون الحاضرون اني اوصي نفسي وياكم بتقوى الله فاتقوا الله تعالى فيما امركم به وتقوه سبحانه وتقوه سبحانه وتعالى في من هاكم عنه فان الله تعالى مع الذين تقوا والذين هم محسنون we praise Allah and ask him to bless the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his family his companions i advise all of you believing people and my sinful self to be mindful of Allah do the things he has commanded you to do and leave those things that he has prohibited you from doing may Allah make that easy for us ya rabbal alamin and may he make his people of taqwa so we talked about the idea of maintaining a nuanced attitude and appreciating that things may appear Uh, uh at first glance to be opposite but they're actually complementary and this is a case in the two narrations we found about the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam one of them being that he was always smiling and the other that he was constantly in a sober a grief stricken state sallallahu alaihi wasallam and we said that that was because why when he was with people he was smiling when he was alone he was uh introspective and that led inevitably to a reverential type of grief sallallahu alaihi wasallam may Allah give us to be nuance people because that's what the next stage of our experience as a community is inevitably going to demand that we're people who maintain nuance we have to be we are a community that is not entirely of the west or entirely of the east or somewhere in between we are not entirely stuck in the pre-modern world nor are we entirely uh, modern people we're somewhere in between so we have to maintain nuances and i'll leave you with a statement of one of the great saints who said you'll never come into true knowledge of allah hatta tajma' bayn al-ghaddain until you're able to reconcile between two things that appear to be opposite because we're existent but in reality we're perishing we're alive but in reality we're not really alive we're here but we're not really here this is the nature of uh, the world that we live in may Allah give us to maintain a nuanced attitude and when we do that it should make it easy for us to get along with not necessarily kumbaya with not necessarily uh, you know feel wonderful about but at least get along with Muslims we disagree with We can maintain an attitude of tolerance with those people who we have a different interpretation with. May Allah take out of our heart rancor for the believing people, Ya Rabbi Alameen. And may Allah take out of our hearts arrogance, Ya Rabbi Alameen. And may Allah take out of our hearts vanity, Ya Rabbi Alameen. And may Allah take out of our hearts love of the world, Ya Rabbi Alameen. Oh Allah, whatever you put in our hands of worldly possessions, never put them in our hearts, Ya Rabbi Alameen. We ask you Allah to bless this masjid and this community. And to bless our families and our parents and our teachers and our loved ones. And we ask you to bless Allahumma, especially our teachers, Ya Rabbi Alameen. Anyone who ever taught us so much as one letter, we ask you that you make the reward that they enter paradise. Be ready hisab or be ready adab, Ya Rabbi Alameen. Without any account, without any reckoning, Ya Rabbi Alameen. and to bless our teachers families and to bless their parents and to bless their loved ones ya rabbil alamin we ask you allahumma to make us a source of mercy and good and light for the umma make us allahumma man abrakat umma ala umma from the most blessed of the umma for the umma ya rabbil alamin wa man anfa al umma lil umma and the most beneficial of the umma for the umma ya rabbil alamin wa man arham al umma ala umma ya rabbil alamin and from the most merciful of the umma with the umma ya rabbil alamin allahumma fillana dhunubana ya rabbil alamin